Well, to say I've been involved with food plots and experiment with food plots um, in the past is almost an understatement. It's been an obsession. I think we put that on our new website, uh, WHS Wildlife Plans. But bottom line is there's a lot of cool experiments that I've done in the past going back to 25 years or longer. And it's really shaped what I do today. And I want to go over some of these. Um, some of these you'll look at and say, well, it's done all the time now. But these are at a time when I was experimenting when none of this was done before um, that was in print or talked about. And certainly nothing online back then. This is going back a ways, 99, 2000, 95 was my first one clover plot. So I've tried a lot of things throughout the years and it shaped some of the blends we have today. But bottom line is there's some cool experiments. And I have a green check mark next to some and a red X compared to are set next to some other ones. And, um, and that's because there's some of those experiments I wouldn't try again. Um, we, we already learned that that didn't work a long time ago. And so I want to go through some of these. Maybe there's some that you can apply to your own food plotting um, experiments, your own food plot uh, planting practices going into this year. And uh, hopefully it'll make you more successful. But there's some cool experiments we did back in the day uh, before social media and all that stuff and the internet. I mean, even the internet being widely used uh, for any kind of hunting stuff. So going back a crazy long ways when you think about it, some of you youngsters won't remember when you didn't have a lot of food plotting and, and uh, any kind of planting advice online at your fingertips. You, know, you found it in magazines and in print. And that's why back in the day I wrote for Michigan Out of Doors quality whitetails with a QDMA because all we had were hunting forums in the early 2000s end of the the 90s we didn't have these this really good advice that you could find um, from XYZ content creator online like you do nowadays so go with uh, brassica under clover this is an interesting one um, put a green check mark buy it but it's going to come with uh, a few conditions and what I wanted to do with this the purpose of this was to create more life out of the plot because I quickly realized in the UP of Michigan where it's a really cold climate that although clover was great at building a herd and attracting does and fawns creating more of that doe factor that you want when your numbers are low as they were up there that instead of creating that condition where we had deer on the property, they stayed all fall eating this wonderful clover. The clover was down in the dirt by October 1st, middle of October, even with eight acres of plots and not a very big deer herd. It's just that once the frost freeze started taking place in September, every bite was not replaced because it wasn't growing at that time. So while I wanted that clover in the spring to build the deer herd in the summertime and keep those doe, because if you have does and fawns and they have more does, doe fawns on the property, they're probably gonna come back. That's how you build a herd. So I wanted to have that clover a long time. So what I did was I planted a lot of, which we'll talk about clover and cereal grain clover and brassica blends going into the fall. And, and so what that allowed me to do is have that cool season annual in the fall. And then I'd have that summer explosion, spring explosion of fall planted clover from the year before going into the, into the summer. And I get that really good volume of clover. So basically from an August 1st planting of a brassica and clover plot or a September 1st planting of a rye and clover, or oats and clover, or oats and rye and clover, then I'd have clover in that spot growing early spring because it'd shoot up because it's already got its roots established in the fall i'd have that carry on all the way to late summer so it truly was a 365 day uh planting and that's why we we have to this day in our in our blends we have a 365 dual threat combo where we have clover and brassica and we do that a little bit different too um, i'll mention this what we found was in there that you don't want to have big bulbs in a brassica blend when you mix it with clover because if you have 40 percent bulb space or 33 percent bulb space in a food plot the fall that fall that's 33 percent or 40 percent or even 50 percent where you're not going to be growing clover in the following year and it takes a long time for that to for that to actually fill in so you make sure you take the big bulbs out i'm giving away some secrets but we learned this 20 some years ago talked about it in some hunting forum or some article somewhere so it's already out there the bottom line is, in this case right here, we've already planted a clover base in the fall. It comes into its first spring. Whether that was planted with brassica the year before, because you can plant that area with two years brassica at the most, and then, or it was cereal grain. When you went into that following spring, you're left with, in the case of brassica and clover, or even oats and clover, you're left with clover growing, and it's not that thick of, of clover. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to time it with, I would actually go a little bit lighter on my clover blend in the fall. Let's say instead of eight pounds per acre, I'd go to five or four. 
in the soil. I have 50% of the field that's clover, but that's it, 50%. I'd wait until about a week before my projected last frost date. I'd try to push that envelope as, as fast as possible. And then I would broadcast turnips at a rate of about a pound and a half per acre, which is a half boat of turnips, three pounds is a full acre. So I go a half, uh, one and a half pounds of purple top turnips at Green Globe now. And the idea behind that was that I'd have that brassica growing under the clover. Going into the summer, the brassica gets shaded by the clover, the bulb itself. But the bulb still develops because the brassica itself is keeping pace with the clover, and that's key. If you have too much clover in the spring, say 60, 70% clover and only 30% soil exposure, 40%, I found that 50% was necessary. Then what would happen is that the clover would overtake that young brassica and it would actually kill it and shade it out and kill it. So I found that I wanted to push that envelope about a week before last frost date. I, it would be great if it was two weeks before and you look in the forecast, there's no nights in the 30s at all, then you could broadcast that one and a half pounds of purple top turnips right into the clover because the clover, again, you cut it in half the year before. And then when I'm actually spreading the brassica, I hope this makes sense, I'm spreading the remaining four pounds per acre of clover along with that purple top turnip. So in that case, it'd be five and a half pounds of seed, one and a half pounds of purple top, and then four pounds of the remaining clover blend that I didn't add in the fall. That way that portion that's more open soil is keeping pace with each other. I know this experimental stuff worked out really well though because in that short growing season um, where you would get early frost um, in the fall, then I would have that growing from June and July, August, so three months at the most, not really a lot of time for it to rot. And then I didn't have those really high, hot heat areas um, in August. So that's shaded. And so I found that those purple tops would actually stay pretty firm going into September and October in that first frost. So it was a way to maximize the space in that food plot and bring that brassica in another year in that area. Why did I do that? Because again, in a lot of areas, until you get down to especially Southern Indiana, Southern Ohio, on my main food plots, you get into West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, that that clover in those areas would keep growing into November because it's warmer. Where you get into these Northern states, it would frost and it would stop it growing and until it really warmed up in the spring, it wasn't growing again at, at spring green up is when it would come open up. So that was a way to get more life into the plot. So basically I was, planting clover with a cool season annual, and then I was adding another cool season annual, basically, in the springtime frost seeding under those parameters. So I hope that makes sense. It's something I would try, especially if you're in more of a northern state than a southern state. Um, but it is, it was experimental, it did work, um, but it's not something we're putting into our blends because that's not the typical time for planting brassica in the spring. And, uh, and this is a completely different type method for planting and really bringing life into that food plot for particular areas. And that's the thing, a lot of these seeds, a lot of these seed blends are good for certain areas. Um, you know, you can make a case that certain types and varieties of corn or beans might be great in a central state, but not good in a northern state or not good in a southern state. You can't sell these things as if it's the greatest uh, food plot blend ever in every state. There's no such thing. Number two, clover and brassica combo planting. And I talked about that, and that was something I experimented with in the end of the 90s. It was something that was really innovative at that time because no one else was doing it. And the reason I did it is, again, I wanted to have a 365-day planting where I plant this combo, it lasts for 365 days. So very important combo. But like I said, we learned along the way, you don't put a lot of big bulb in combination with that clover because that was taking up space for the following spring for that clover to grow. We also, if you wanted to add chicory, chicory, you wanted to add birdsfoot trefoil, you just frost that even that in the spring into that existing clover and it'll keep pace and, and grow, but you didn't necessarily need it to take a space, especially if you're paying for it as a super blend in the fall, I'd rather see you just add that in the spring if you want to add that diversity to it. So you limit the number of clovers in there in perennial type you're limiting the green globe and then you're putting those together and, and you're planting those so that it ends up a 365 day planting. Now what I would do with that is I would rotate. And so what I mean by that is I would actually plant the entire plot if I was starting year one, plant the 
entire plot in maybe oats and clover on one side around Labor Day in, in that case, maybe middle of September for you or late September if you're further south. And then I'd plant that, plant that brassica blend on the other half. What I'd do is I'd pick my best half and I'd keep it going into the next fall, you know, that high volume clover. On the other half, I'd start the process over again. I'd rip it up, till brassica, or plant brassica and clover into it, or oats and clover, plant about four weeks later. And, uh, and in that way, I'm rotating and I'm, basically each planting is good for two years on each side, so you're ever rotating the two. So your actual fall crop is always switching sides going into the fall, but it always has that base of clover, so the following summer you have a full plot of clover. Again, I'm doing that when I wanna build a herd. When I wanna maintain or lose a herd, I start getting rid of the clover. So a lot of these practices throughout the 2000s, I stopped using in rotation because I didn't, I built the deer herd up because of the clover, because of having those summer plots. And then I actually diminished going from eight and a half acres of clover throughout the summer to one acre. And even then I saw to mow it because the deer didn't need that food during the summertime. They had an overabundance of food, even in a place like the UP of Michigan where there's not a lot of great habitat for deer. And you have those hard winters. I found that what you gave the deer right before winter and right after winter was more important than what they got during the summertime. So you never wanted to offer that trade and say, I want to have a great summer amount of food because it could create too many does and fawns. And you might be doing that at the expense of your fall plantings, which were ultimately a lot more important for the deer than what went on during the summer. This also worked with rye, oats, and wheat. And I think I might even talk about that somewhere else, but the bottom line is rye, oats, and wheat, that worked pretty well. I didn't mind, you know, you basically brassica, in that case, around August 1st, end of July. And then around Labor Day, if I wanted to put clover in with oats, rye, or wheat, I did so. You do use the full boat of oats, rye, or wheat, the full amount per acre. Usually on Labor Day up there, I'd use 150 pounds per acre, and then I'd actually layer it later, which we'll talk about uh, later in September, so I had a thicker stand but that didn't compete with the clover establishing its roots in the fall. And then in the spring, I'd spray out or mow out, which we'll talk about both here in a second, the cereal grain. It, the oats would die over the winter and turn brown, so there were no competition to the clover the following year. But that wasn't a bad way to go either. Um, I found that it was a successful stand of clover the following summer, either way, because I established it uh, during the fall and not the spring. Then you get into the buckwheat no-till. Buckwheat no-till was really important to me because I was using big rotations to improve very, very bad soil. If you look, at, look up improving poor soil food plots, and you find my old article, I wrote that maybe in 2006, um, 2005 for the QDMA, and then I posted it after that. But it's an old article that's out there, but it shows the parts per million of one year later and three years later on food plots and how they changed over that time by doing those rotations that I talk about. Uh, rye in the fall, buckwheat in the summer. I like both those, but the buckwheat didn't add any food going into the fall, and there are better things than just straight rye, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, going into the fall for the deer herd. So I wanted to come up with other things. What I found with, instead of going in and ripping up the buckwheat that might be five feet tall with a six foot tiller and almost starting the tiller on fire because it was so matted up with buckwheat and burning and getting hot and rolling it around I had to stick my tiller in the sand basically was it was a lot more efficient for me to seed into the standing buckwheat and I did that with brassica back then you know over 20 years ago and did that with rye oats wheat and I even did it back in 2007 I did it uh, with grass seeding into the buckwheat my grass seed for a late summer grass seed uh, uh, catch and I did that with rye as a cover crop, and then I mowed out the rye the following year, along with the grass that grew up in the spring, and I was able to establish my lawn uh, doing that behind a cabin. So I tried a lot of different seeds to make sure that. I tried a lot of different products be besides buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat was the only product that you can run over with a Packer Max like we do and just smash it down. You can run it over with your ATV tires, truck tires, car tires, ATV ramp turned sideways. We found all of that. The problem is you can mow buckwheat. We repeat that, you can mow buckwheat. It'll grow back. Why is that a bad thing? Because when you just go down and smash it down, it's laying flat, and you put small seeds in there like brass or clover, the buckwheat can grow so fast if you don't spray it and kill it. It doesn't matter if you crimp it, roll it, whatever, because again, you can mow it, that it'll outcompete the brass and clover coming in. Some people have a light enough stand, though, it's a catch, 
but it's not something you can depend on all the time. So that's where I started establishing those buckwheat rotations. You're seeding into the standing buckwheat, knocking it down. I've also um, used buckwheat as knocking it down, spraying it, then go back a week later and and broadcast brassica, uh, clover, brassica clover combo, chicory, birds or tree foil, whatever's in that combination. And I uh, had a really good catch like that because those small seeds don't need to be worked into the soil. In fact, most people work them in too far. If you work them in over a quarter inch, they die because they still germinate. Sunlight doesn't hit the plant and it dies. So that's one I use a lot. The ultimate no-till planting. I've talked about that. It's um, some people, you know, talk about that this has been around for a long, but it has been around for a long time. It was chapter 12 of my 2014 food pot book. So we're going on nine years. That's been a long time. And I talked a lot about it before those times. You look back in Michigan Sportsman's Forums, things like that. QDMA used to have some forums that I talked about it back then. So yeah, it's been around a long time. And, uh, and I, I talked about and innovated that in the early 2000s. So it's been a great uh, practice uh, for us. And I encourage that use. It's perfect for our green blend, our fall power green uh, blends, brassica. And again, I like killing it knocking it over, then then killing it, and then spreading your seed about a week later into it when it's those small seeds, those tiny seeds. Rye clover combos, mowing or spraying in the spring. So when I'm planting with rye or wheat in the fall with clover, you always let your cool seeds in the annual determine the timing of your planting, meaning if it's brassica, you plant earlier. If it's cereal grains, you plant about five weeks later. That's why you don't combine the two. They're about a five week difference in growth. We'll talk about that of perfect planting time and that affects each other if you plant them together. It hurts one or the other depending on what the timing is when you have cereal grains and brassica. We'll, we'll talk about that. When you plant with clover it can be a great way to establish clover but you have to mow it out the following year or kill it. What I found was mowing it sometimes if you mowed too early gave it a partial kill. You wanted to wait until that rye was starting to turn brown. You could mow it then. It's not going to come back. You ran a real risk if you waited too far or too long. You had way too much rye thatch. It would get five feet tall. And it, takes a, it takes years to break down in the soil. It's high organic matter, low, fine organic matter. So it takes years to break down. That's why you don't want summer blend. You want a bunch of sorghum. It might look cool during the summer. You think you're putting a lot back in the soil, but you're actually taking many nutrients to break down that sorghum. So just because it's high organic matter doesn't mean it's a good thing. What would happen with that rye if you waited till that time? You could actually have a viable seed head. So imagine you have that clover down there that's thin and sparse because it's almost like trees growing in a forest. They grow tall and straight, not really a good ground cover. You mow it out, all those rye seed heads go down to the ground. They grow faster than the clover that time of year and they shade out your clover and kill it. That can happen. If you do that with the rye and you wait till that long, also you can have a very thin stand of clover going into the following fall because again, it's almost like if you've ever seen pine trees growing in a forest, when it was established all at the same time, those pine trees will grow with not very many branches, tall and straight like a white pine. That out in the open will look like a maple tree. It'll have huge lower branches because it's getting the full sun. But when it's in a woods, it grows spindly and tall. Sunlight can't get to it, so it doesn't grow thick like you want that clover to grow. So I found overall, I carried clethodim. Clethodim is a grass-specific herbicide. You don't spray it on uh, switchgrass. You don't spray it on growing rye or oats unless you want to kill it. Unless you want to kill the switchgrass. Spray clethodim down and that would take out my rye in the spring. Let that clover flourish and cover the ground so that by July you had a very thick coating of pure clover. You didn't have that tall spindly clover. So I chose to use chemicals as a one-time spraying on that food plot in the spring so that I had a quality stand of clover going in the fall or at least the, the best quality that I could that I could have. Seeding into clover. This will be your, you see that first red X by, don't do it. Clover's thick, it's matting, it has a weed suppressant uh, quality because it's a, it can be a smother crop. What that means is if you throw seeds into clover that's an established stand, it doesn't matter if you mow it down to five inches, unless you're extremely lucky, get a lot of moisture and you have open poor growing so clover with a lot of soil exposure, you're not gonna get growth from brassica, heck even other clover, rye seeds, will all get out-competed oats, Peas, whatever you throw in there, they get outcompeted by the clover. By the clover stand, you don't get a good catch. You don't even get 50%. So wasting a lot of seed to get 10%, 15% growth in that stand. Tried it, been there, don't do it. Again, the whole idea is, yeah, we have this clover field. Now I want to have rye. I want to have brassica growing in it. Folks who did that 20 years ago and figured out it didn't work. So I don't do that today or, or recommend it. 
Number six, spring clover with brassica. Would I do that? Meaning you're throwing out spring planting of a combo like that, like we would in the fall. Not a good idea to do. And I found in the UP of Michigan, you guys will find this interesting, but one of the first times we ever had brassica on the property, this had been around 2099. Well, this is awesome. I can put brassica in, didn't understand the growing maturity rates, that kind of thing. We'll put it in May, end of May. I'm going to let it go until fall because, quote, they don't touch it. Even back then, there was, they're not going to touch it until it gets first frost. It turn, needs to get a first frost turn sweet. Folks, we figured out 20 years ago, 15 years ago, before any kind of studies, that it doesn't have anything to do with first frost because when that clover and brassica combo got into June, the clover was going great, brassica was going, doing really well. Let's say it was eight inches tall. It got annihilated and mowed down to the ground by a deer herd that was not very plentiful and didn't have an ag field for 20 miles in every direction. It was just the best green source available and they ate it. They left the clover. Seems like perfect scenario, right? They had a good boost of food in the spring, had some brassica, but guess what? Because that clover was spring planted and there's no cover crop to it, then it got heated out during the summer. We went through nine weeks of less than an inch of rain and the clover was killed, fizzled out. So I really don't like planting clover in the spring unless I'm using oats as a cover crop like they do with hay. You use 50 pounds of oats per acre. So we have our premium, you know, we have our perennial, high quality perennial blend that we can put into that, into that area in the spring, 50 pounds of oats per acre, and those oats act as, a act as a nurse crop and help ward off the effects of sunlight during the summer. You're letting that go for about two months and then you just mow the oats out and you're left with a pure stand of clover. You don't mow it out when you're gonna have three weeks of drought. You can see in the forecast, there's no rain coming, you mow it when you have a good rainy period. Mow out the oats and that clover, clover will come in and flourish and, and live. Layering rye. Layering rye was something that I did originally as a rye plot selvage, but then I started incorporating it, like our green blends. We have a, a fall dry poor soil blend with more competing varieties, and then we have a more premium type uh, fall power greens, but both of those, I want you to add 150 pounds of rye per acre about a month later. You plant those both at the time, the planting timing for Nebraska, which is early August, around here, might be late July up north, might be, down in a line like uh, Tennessee, West Virginia, down there, even Oklahoma, that might be more like a mid-August to late-August time frame. But then about four weeks later, you're adding 150 pounds of rye. And again, you don't let that rye in the spring get more than 18, 24 inches. I want to kill it out or mow it out. Mow it out at that perfect time to get rid of it or kill it because I don't want to go to five feet tall. It's not actually putting organic matter back in the soil when it takes years to break down, pulling nutrients to do so. So I like planting spring clover will do that and it's not really frost seeding you can throw it at on the ground before any rain and if you're getting appreciable rain for a month the clover will do really well but the problem is it needs a nurse crop and that's where the oats come in so layering rye i plan on planting that rye over products where you have that initial high quality green blend might have peas in there, hairy vetch, even late planted buckwheat, buckwheat you're planting at the right poundage. That's why you don't want buckwheat to come up and compete like when you have the ultimate no-till. You wanna kill it, make sure it's gone because you'll get thousands of pounds of seed per acre coming up, not 20 pounds of seed that doesn't compete with the other crops, but they're all candy crops that time of year. And then you're laying it with rye later so that you continue the effectiveness of the plot. I usually do that right next to or an adjacent field of Nebraska or the other half of the field of Nebraska. Number eight here, something I highly encourage, three sprayings in a planting. Now Ed Spinozola did this back in the day. It was in the 90s. He's one of the few sources for food planting back then where he would spray three times and then the following spring he would frost seed clover. I always thought it was a sin to take soil into the fall that's open, exposed. You can throw something on it then. So that's when I would plant a cool season annual with clover starting in 99. I wanted to maintain a good base of clover in the future, again, at that time to build a herd, because if you had summer food, you built a herd. But then I didn't want that cool season angel around the next year. So oats were great, spraying out the rye, mowing out the rye, or using brassica in the fall was great because you could spray, go around here, it'd be early May, mid-June, end of July, but then you have an open field, you can throw small seeds, or even moderate seeds like rye, oats, and wheats. They grow great on exposed soil. 
but so does chicory, so does bird's foot trefoil, brassica, clover, all those small seeds you can throw right on top of the soil. You don't need to work them in before rain, and you don't even need much rain to grow that at that time. So that was something you did often, you know, layering rye, and then those three sprayings, you could put an early crop. If you needed a plot salvage of rye, you could do that five or six weeks later, throw 150 pounds of rye over the top of it, enjoy the season. If the brassica didn't grow because of drought or it got just complete demolished by over browsing, you could do that. So that layering rye was a great use for a lot of these things, but those three springs were perfect. Don't do just two springs. We learned that the hard way. We hit our first spring, get a great kill. Not go down six weeks later, so we're not killing anything. Go down four to six weeks after that, the weeds are now three, four feet tall, and there's such a mat of weeds that you couldn't get something to grow down within. Always think about that when spraying three times and planting. Now, I'd rather rotate uh, buckwheat in there and just spray twice or spray once if I could get away with it. The bottom line is when you're spraying to open up soil, if you only spray two times, you're gonna have too much weed mat on that second or third spraying unless it was a poorly uh, poor nutrient plot, you don't have a lot of weed growth in, it's very sparse weeds to begin with. The bottom line is on a normal food plot area that's just adequate for average for quality or soil quality or conditions, then you need all three springs. And if you don't, there's such a mat that you can't get down through. And that's why the first spring in your, free three, your three spring combo is the most important, not the last. Remember Ed back in the day would talk about the last spring is most important because then that would allow dead things in the in the spring. But as a moot point at that that point, if you'd already sprayed one, two, and that's your third spring, you're going to have open soil going into the spring. But what was really important is the first spring eliminated weed competition and weed competition in the for in the form of dead debris and matting that wouldn't allow the seed to go through. Or if the seed did get through down to the soil. It was shaded out by that mat, couldn't get sunlight, and it grew up and died. So two springs, no. Three springs, yes, on that. Number nine, cereal grain and brass guy. I talked about this before. I've talked about it a lot. The two need to be planted about five weeks apart. What happens when you put cereal grains with brassica early? The cereal grains outcompete the brassica. They shade them out, kill them. You get poor, uh, nutrient-starved brassica that turn purple and reddish mostly. More white shows it's more water damaged, uh, typically too much moisture. If it's more red, it's nutrient starved, purple, nutrient starved. So when you put them both together at the same time as the planting timing for brassica, the cereal grains out compete the brassica. And what happens if you plant it around Labor Day? You know, a month later, five weeks later, more traditional timing for cereal grains. The cereal grain beats out the, the brassica. So you have to remember that cereal grains always wins. It's going to grow faster. It's going to be more aggressive. And it's out, going to outcompete the brassica. So why would I put a lot of it in one? It's it's fine to have a small crop of oats in there. We have a small we have a summer plow down that has hairy vetch, medium red clover, some buckwheat, and a little bit of oats for more fine organic matter. But you're not letting that go very far, and it's a small enough amount that it doesn't outcompete anything. So it's really important to understand that. But when you're traditionally mixing those two in the fall for a planting, you can't put those two together because your brassicas are just a waste of money at that point by having that in there. More is not better when it comes to mixing seeds and blends. Having more seed in the mix, having 10, 12, 20 different seeds in, in a mix is a bad thing because you can't go too far outside of, say, that brassica. You can't start adding cereal grain to it. You can add clover to it. You can add chicory. Bird's foot tree fall because none of that competes with the brassica. But when you start adding cereal grains to the brassica, they compete. So that's why you're limited on the amount, total amount of seeds you can ever put together because one out competes the other. It's the same with some of the super blends for plow down mixes in the summer. Each has a purpose. So then you think, the consumer, that each one of these has a purpose. I only have four in our blend, our summer plow down, because I want the best of all four. And I don't want to have 20 in there. So it's jack of all trades, master of none. That's basically what happens. Some of them out compete, some of them don't even show. So you don't want to do that. Usually you have to have a smaller amount of seeds in a blend because you start adding portions of other seed varieties that compete and they don't mix well together. Number 10, chicory and clover. Hey folks, now chicory comes with clover. It didn't in the past. You had to add your own clover or your own chicory. So that's what I would do. I finally, I learned 20 some years ago, there's horse chicory 
and there's chicory, there's more forage and for deer. You don't want the horse chicory. But bottom line is a standalone planting of chicory is about three pounds per acre. That's why you don't want a pound or two pounds. We put three quarters of a pound. Does, you, does it make sense? We put three quarters of a pound of chicory in with clover. That's 25% of the mix space-wise because that's a, a quarter acre. So we need to add appropriately with the, uh, with the clover. Learn this stuff, you know, again, 20 years ago. What's interesting about this is what I found was the deer up north, they didn't hit the chicory very hard. Some areas they hit them harder than others. And a lot of that has to do with drought or heat conditions because chicory has a long taproot. It'll find moisture and be tender and succulent when clover might be fizzled to the ground and a lot of other products you might have during the summertime. So that chicory might be the only thing green there, so deer eat it, especially if you have high deer numbers. That explains why there's usage of some things versus others. You can apply that to a lot of different uh, food, food blend varieties. So chicory acts as a great nurse crop for clover, and that's why I liked it in the spring. We found that out throughout the years, that when you have about three quarters of a pound of chicory, that was a perfect balance where if you had drought during the summer, let's go back to that nine weeks of less than an inch of rain, then the half of clover that we planted with chicory would be green and lush because it was being nursed along by the chicory and the half that was pure clover would be half as high and more of a yellowish green and not as healthy. Chicory was acting as a nurse crop. That's why I included in our chicory and clover blends and perennial blend. That's why I think it's important. Not because I think it's going to add this huge food value. It might in some circumstances, but most of the time it's an incredible nurse crop. And so by the time like our spring product where we have an appropriate amount of chicory in there, and then you add 50 pounds of oats per acre, you mow the oats out later, it helps you withstand drought. Otherwise, I like planting clover just purely in the fall with a cool season annual. Again, you let the cool season annual determine the timing of the planting. And that way you can withstand any drought that Mother Nature throws at that clover the following year because it was fall established. Fall established, gets its roots down, gets another great shot of moisture in the spring, further deepens the roots, and then you get into drought the following summer, it's deep enough, those roots are deep enough to withstand drought. Rye plot save. That's really important. Rye plot save. This is where brassica crop in 2002. It was a smaller food plot, maybe a half acre, three quarters of an acre in the UP. Went on vacation towards the end of August, came back. Brassica was looking great. Went back out there and it's eaten halfway down to the ground. It's going the wrong way and it's not going to recover. I said, well, I'm going to throw 100 pounds of rye per acre over it. Man, you know, a week later, I'm going to throw another 100 pounds down. And so I was layering this rye on top trying to get a plot salvage and cover the ground because I found 100 pounds wasn't really thick enough. You know what happened that was really cool? Is as the rye continued to grow, and let's say it was in that two week stage, week and a half, 10 days to three weeks a month, deer love it. Especially when they can consume a lot because you put a high percentage or high amount of pounds down per acre, they'll eat it. So you're really covering a high percentage of the ground. So every bite, they can get a lot of succulent young rye. And what happened? They left the brassica alone. We actually got growth off the brassica because we put that rye in there. Again, this is over 20 years ago. Started using this rye plot salvage. And I found out more is better when it comes to rye most of the time. I started layering rye, meaning layering rye that I put 100 pounds down early. So let's say my first frost date in the UP of Michigan was around September 15th. Then I'd put rye down about August 20th, maybe three weeks before that, three and a half weeks. I'd put 100 pounds of rye down then, 100 pounds of rye at around my first frost, and about 100 pounds two to three weeks after that. What you're trying to do is fill the ground horizontally, not vertically. We're not harvesting this rye or wheat, even in, in that same scenario, the following year for seed head production. Seed head production would be affected if you put too much out. They're each competing with each other, like bluegills in a pond, you know, small bluegills. So what you're doing is you're, you're staggering that, so you're filling that layer so by the time you get down here you have at this layer you have two week old rye five week old rye and eight week old rye all in that same layer you're filling space horizontally i hope that makes sense so deer tend to feed down and get big feeding circles in a case like that instead of just being browsers and you don't want to plant 300 pounds per acre all at once unless it's a plot salvage and you're drought over browsing you can throw that rye down later so layer, when you layer, you're adding 100, 100, 100, maybe even 50 pounds first and then 100, 100. Bottom line is if you don't have at least 50, 60% soil exposure, meaning look at the ground for that third planting, then you might want to forego the third layering because you don't have enough soil exposure. Because I've even had brassica 
you know, this would be another experiment. I should put this as number 13 up here. And this is a big red X don't do. You think, well, brassica, if you plant it um, early, on time, without rye, then you get a great crop of brassica. So, in theory, you wait five weeks, put about 200 pounds of rye down per acre. Then you can't do that. So brassica first, then rye. You can't do that. It's a big red X. Because even though rye is one of the most shade tolerant, soil tolerant seed varieties there are that you can plant, that's per Michigan State University study, grow in the coldest temperature, germinate in the coldest temperatures, it can't be shaded out completely and it dies. That's why we don't use shady food plot mixes because if you don't plant in the sunlight for at least six hours of sunlight a day, you're not gonna get a, enough food plot volume no matter what you plant. So the answer to a shady food plot, that's another experiment here. I'm not gonna take the time to write down, but the answer to that is get more sunlight to your plot. But bottom line is what happened was in that case, brassica was six, eight inches high. We throw 200 pounds of rye down per acre within the brassica. The brassica shades out the rye and doesn't let any of it grow. Rye won't grow in total shade. So big failure. Number 12 right here, going back about 12 years, 13 years, I was planting a lot of oats, beans, and pea combination. I used that for two or three years, four years ago. That's going back 10 years. What I found was if I put about 40 pounds of oats, which is what I did, 30 to 40 pounds of oats per acre, I put about 25 pounds of beans, and I put about 100 pounds of peas. It wasn't the problem with the beans and peas, it was the problem with the oats. Because you need to plant beans and peas more August 1st at brassica planting time to actually get good volume and, and appreciate the amount of growth that's in there. Now in an up north setting, this would work pretty well where you have heavy browse pressure because you're putting oats down too early. What would happen is they get 10, 12, 14 inches head out, get stemmy, dormant, and they'd block off the feeding from everything else. Now in a in a area where there's not a lot of food, like a non-ag area up north somewhere, short growing season, they might hit the oats pretty high. And so when I go to a client property in those areas, I might recommend something like this. But what we found is in most areas, the oats outcompeted the uh, peas, the beans. And then when it came to the beans, unless you got a lot of rain, even if you're using the ultimate no-till and covered up the beans with the smashed down buckwheat, you weren't getting appreciable bean growth. So that was a bad thing. You're kind of wasting the bean seed at that point, 25 pounds per acre. Peas are great. They'll grow anywhere. Um, they'd get shaded out a little bit. They just grow taller. They're vining. It's not a bad, bad thing with the peas, but the oats were stifling. So in ag areas, you planted that mix. It was bad. We learned after a year or two. And then what I would do is I'd take that mix. I'd add another 100 pounds of peas to it, blend it all together, put about 15 pounds of buckwheat on top of it, put about five pounds of tillage radish on top of it, mix it all together. Now I'm diluting the amount of rye or oats in there. And then you're having more of an appropriate amount. That's why in our fall blend, we have a small amount of oats, more like 10 pounds per acre, because we know hunters are gonna use too much. We don't want you to shade out and outcompete. And then we get rid of the beans in that mix because you're just wasting seeds. And then we add more like late season buckwheat. We want that heavy green amount. We add a lot of peas. Hairy vetch is a quick one that grows fast in that mix. So that mix is always changing for me. But we learned 10 years ago that you don't want too much oats in your, in, in as far as, that 40 pounds, 30 pounds per acre, because it'll start to outcompete everything. And you don't want beans in that mix, because unless you have the perfect conditions, a lot of moisture, or a good thatch of buckwheat over the top, which it's hard to plant into that then, you needed to more till it, um, then you weren't getting a good catch. So it, it was more of a miss than a hit in a lot of areas, and that's why I diluted it through the last several years, changing that complexity, and that what that's what led to our fall power greens today. That's why our fall power greens are different than they were last year, that's why Nebraska blend is different than they were last year because every year back in the day when I experimented with this stuff, the mixes were different. Always searching for perfection. That's what led to all this experimentation over the last 25 years. Always searching for perfection. That's what's gone into all the 12 blends we carry. I encourage you, and probably a lot of you haven't checked out the website lately, but whether it's our seed blends, our web classes, our books, missing, oh, and apparel. We have our hats on there. Um, you've probably missed a lot um, that's happening, but you can check out WHS Wildlife Blends. That'll bring you right to our seed site. And I'm giving this information out to you and telling you about a lot of this experimentation and combos that we put into our seed blends today and what didn't work in the past to help you out. 
that's helping you out whether you buy the blends or not. I just want to make sure you do it right because a lot of this stuff we figured out a long time ago and it kind of makes me sick when you see these combinations put out there on the market today sucking hard-earned dollars out. We're doing great with our seed company. I want you to buy seed. You know, that obviously helps us do better, but I don't need you to buy the seed if that makes sense. I just appreciate you buying the seed. There's a difference. I hope that makes sense. I just want to keep you from falling victim to some of the stuff that we figured out a long time ago explain some of these experiments that were a success compared to those that were failures and why the purpose of those plantings all around and i hope it makes some sense to you um you can tell i mean this is something i've been really a big part of for a very long time something i really enjoy to do and that's why ultimately we started the seed company because it's something i've been working towards starting a seed company for many many years and we made it happen it's been a huge success we appreciate the 46 states now that have purchased our seed in just a short eight months. We really appreciate you and all the orders coming in. But once again, whether you buy our seed or not, I hope this stuff helps you. I hope you can appreciate the many decades that have gone into creating these blends and trying to make those as successful as possible. But we'll never find perfection, but I can promise you we'll keep searching for it as I've been doing for the last 25 years with each and every blend. Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to, this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.